got your Bibles this morning? You do have your Bibles? That's good. That's good. That's good. You did a good job today. <laughs> Praise God. If you, if you didn't bring your Bible, there's next Sunday. Bring your Bible. Amen. Praise God. Or, or make sure your battery's charged or however you want to make sure that, make sure that happens. Amen. Anyway, hold this up and say this like you mean it. Every promise in this book is mine. Every chapter, every verse, every line. This word is in me. This word works in me. I am what this word says I am. I can do what this word says I can do. Say it out loud. The favor of God goes before me. Preparing my way for good things. And from this moment forward, my life, my home, and my church will never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you. You can be seated this morning. And it's awesome. Wow, what a move of God's spirit in this place today. Since you have your Bibles in your lap, go ahead and turn with me in the Old Testament, Testament to Habakkuk chapter 3. Habakkuk chapter 3. It's kind of a cookie, cookie name. Um, no, that was just a little preacher joke. Didn't mean anything. Habakkuk chapter 3. Um, beginning in verse number 17. We're going to start there in a moment. Before we do, uh, just last, we've been in a series called uh, The Year of God's Favor. And we, we, we've declared 2022 as the year of favor. And I know, you know, it seems strange, especially reeling off of the last two years where, where it didn't look like anything was favorable. Um, and, it, and there's some challenges up ahead. I mean, it's just turn on the news uh, even this morning, you just listen to it, and there are challenges uh, that we're facing. But, but that doesn't mean that God's people cannot declare the Word of God Amen. over their situations. And so uh, we've been declaring this as the year of God's favor. Um, we started out as a two, three-week series. Uh, this is part number six. I think we're done, but after all, the title is The Year of the Lord's Favor, and so you never know how long we're going to go there. Uh, we, we finished off last Sunday uh, with this thought, and that is the path of God's favor is not always on the mountaintops. Sometimes it winds through the valley. And how many know if we've learned anything from our deep dive in Psalm 23, and that is uh, the psalmist says that he leads me in right paths. And we assume that right paths means that uh, you are experiencing the manifestation of blessing that being outpoured in your life. However, a right path will sometimes also, notice, lead you through uh, green pastures and along still waters. But sometimes that same path of God's favor will lead you through dark valleys. But it's what you notice in whatever season that you're going through, the psalmist happened to notice that there was a table that was prepared before him in the presence of his enemies. He didn't deny the presence of enemies. He says, that's not where my focus is at. My focus is on the provision of God that's in the midst of the circumstances. And, and uh, he says, you know, Jehovah Jireh got in there before me and prepared a table I, I never saw this before in all the years I've read. I've memorized, I, I memorized Psalm 23, I think, before I was about seven years old. I, 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 I've, been, I've known it in multiple different versions of the Bible, uh, translations. Um, I, I know Psalm 23. I can quote it. I can probably start with the last verse and end up in the first verse. I know it. 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 But never before, since before I started the series, did I ever key in on the thought that he says he prepares a table before me. Because one of the definitions of Jireh, we sing about this song called Jireh. We, 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 we love it. He is Jehovah Jireh, the God, our provider, our provision. And one of the definitions is that of Jireh is that he will go before you preparing your way for provision. In other words, he establishes something in the realm of provision before you even roll up on it. Well, I thought that was pretty good. And so the psalmist says he prepared a table before me, before me, and I, I love that. Uh, so the path of God's favor isn't always on the mountaintop. It, it also winds through the valley. You're in Habakkuk chapter 3, beginning in verse number 17. 
this is the New Living Translation, and, and I, I chose this for a reason, but, but even though, he says, even though the fig trees have no blossoms <laughs> and there are no grapes on the vines, and even though the olive crops fail and the fields lie empty and barren, and even though, I mean, you know, he likes that phrase, even though, the flocks die, the sheep die in the fields, and the cattle barns are empty. Now, if we were to stop there and take a page out of Habakkuk's life and his scenario, we would, we would see a circumstance in, in his life and in his people that you would immediately assume that this is someone who is not walking in the path of God's favor. But let me tell you the difference is that Habakkuk has his favor finder glasses on. And he's not denying the hardship that he's dealing with, extreme hardship. What he's saying is, my focus is on something else. And it's the goodness of God. He says, even though, let's go back to it, even though the fig trees have no blossoms, and even though there, there's no grapes on the vines, the, the olives, crops fail, the, the, the fields are, are empty and barren, the, the sheep are dying, the, the, there's, no, there's no cattle being, being born, there's, there's nothing in the stalls, even though everything is empty. He said, I got my favor finder glasses on. Look what he says in verse 19, the sovereign Lord is my strength. Or verse 18, verse 18, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes me as sure-footed as a deer, able to tread upon the heights. Now, can I just tell you that Habakkuk isn't just being a positive thinker. He's not just staying positive in downward situations and scenarios. He's putting his attention on God's Word. Amen. He's literally quoting Psalm 118. You don't have to do it now, but I challenge you if you're taking notes to go back and read Psalm 118 and you'll see that he's quoting directly from Psalm 118. I love that, that he's got his favor finder glasses on, but his foundation is God's word. And I love that. So if we just framed one section of Habakkuk's life, we would see extreme hardship. But remember what we learned last week is that a good life, like a good book, has many chapters. But a chapter is a chapter is a chapter. Remember how I annoyed you guys last night, last week? Remember how I was so annoying? Okay, I'm not going to annoy you nearly as much today, maybe. But a chapter is a chapter is a chapter is a chapter. It's not necessarily the story. Amen. It doesn't mean it's, it's the story. How many know the name Tyler Perry? Yeah. I got a picture of him up here. He is a... Uh, um, you know, you know, I, even for me, I think this is a good-looking guy right here. I'm just saying. I don't know. But you know, Tyler, he is a, uh, he's a famous uh, writer, uh, movie producer, and actor. He's also a believer in Christ. And if you were to take a chapter out of Tyler's life, he is a young man who was raised up in extreme poverty. He was abused by his father. He was living in his car at the age of 28. But Tyler learned something along the way that set him apart. What did he learn? A chapter is a chapter. It's not the story. God has a plan and a purpose. How many know the name Bethany Hamilton? Bethany Hamilton won first place in the Women's National Championship in surfing. Uh, you know her story, but if you were to take a, a chapter out of Bethany's life, she's 13 years old, she's practicing surfing in the ocean, and she's attacked by a shark and she loses her left arm. Now, if you know anything about surfing, you know that how important upper body strength is, and you know... Uh, how important uh, what, what the, the role that both arms and upper body strength play in especially competitive surfing, that to 
even catch the wave and use your body and your arms and, and, and to, to get the perfect wave that will cause you to score the best points and, and to be able to pull yourself up on the board and position yourself when you only have a split-second moment to react. And all that has to happen and be fine-tuned. And then to use your arms to balance the, the center and, and your core is extremely important. And yet now she's faced with uh, the inevitable. Uh, she, she's faced with the possibility of losing her dream, but she continues forward against all odds, and she ends up winning the national championship. How did she do it? Because Bethany Hamilton, who's a strong believer in Christ, says a chapter is a chapter is a chapter, and it's not the story that God had planned for me. Amen. Amen. Favor, if you're taking notes, is the outworking of God's grace. That means you may experience favor not because you did anything to earn it, but simply because God wanted you to have it. A lot of people take the position that good is more powerful than grace. And that favor is somehow the reward for your good. But please hear me when I say that Favor is not the outworking of your good. It's the outworking of his grace. I, I can say it this way. Favor doesn't do background checks. And, and it doesn't cause you to go through a screening process. Here is the difference between the mercy side of God's grace and the favor side. Mercy doesn't give you what you deserve. But favor gives you what you don't deserve. Isn't that good? So when you see favor as an expression of God's grace, you'll start to see things happening to you that are disproportionate to what you deserve. We call that heaven's nepotism. <laughs> uh, when you think of the word nepotism, terrible images are conjured up in your mind unless you are the recipient of it. <laughs> right? How many of you looked across the cubicle and saw someone who didn't belong there but because their, their grandma ma'am or the grandpa or their aunt, uncle was a part of the, the leadership team, suddenly they got the job, you know. But heaven's nepotism is different because it's not based upon what you've done or, or what you did. It's based upon who you are in him. Amen. It's based upon your relationship and your identity with, with Christ. Heaven's nepotism means that I can celebrate the fact that I, as Sandy put so eloquently, am a child of the Most High God. And I have favored child status. Not because of anything I did or am doing, but simply, solely, and purely because of my relationship and my identity with Him. Uh, it says it like this in 2 Corinthians verse, chapter 6, verse 18. I will be a father to you. And by the way, this is New Testament. I felt like I had to say that. <laughs> I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord. Can I, give you, can I summarize that verse for you? Favor isn't fair. Favor isn't fair. Um, so stop trying to make it fair. In fact, let me say this. Some of you guys need to stop apologizing or trying to legitimize God's blessings over your life to people who may not know it or know about it, or who may even be jealous of you. That's part A. 
How many of you are ready for part B? Anybody ready for part B? I don't know if you're ready for it. <laughs> Stop resenting the undeserved favor. Like when you see someone who's being blessed and you don't think they deserve it, it's probably because they don't. <laughs> So stop resenting the undeserved favor you see in someone else's life if you're going to welcome it in your own life. Are we tracking this morning? Amen? Favor isn't fair. Why? Because life isn't fair. And what's interesting is that some of the same people that you will hear, believers, who will push away from a message like this, who will say things like, you know, this whole thing about favor and all that, we just, you know, this, this is not right, you know, will be the same people who will talk about how, how life isn't fair and why is it that that person always catches the breaks and I was deserving of it or why, why is it that I always get the short end of the stick and I was here longer than they were uh, they, they, they didn't do anything to deserve it uh, the promotion had my name all over it but they knew someone and <laughs> life isn't fair life isn't fair life isn't fair life isn't fair and so when you think about that it kind of makes sense right and not that our finite ways of thinking can actually make sense of what a sovereign God chooses to do based on his his own nature. But can I just tell you that because life isn't fair, think about this, that the undeserved random distribution of favor is the response of a just God to an unfair world? That perhaps God is, when he's bestowing favor upon his people, who are living in an unfair world, that that is his way of reconciling the unfair world that sin has established in the earth? I you think about that this morning. Um, I love the story of Ruth. And Ruth is one of those Bible characters who found the favor of God in her life and working through her life. Um, I'm going to try to give you some points this morning on her life because I love it, but, let, but we need to talk about, first of all, who, who Ruth is. Ruth, as you know, in the Bible, she is a Moabite woman. So she is a Moabitist. <laughs> um, she, is, she was not born in, in, in the in nation of Israel. She's not a Hebrew. And therefore, she is not an heir to the covenants of promise. At the time of the writing of her story, Israel is in a famine. And because they're in a famine, Elimelech and Naomi take their two sons and they leave Bethlehem and they travel, travel to Moab uh, for, some, for some help during the famine. And so... After they get to Moab, there's some time later, uh, Naomi's husband dies. Later on, her two sons marry two young ladies in Moab. Now, one was named Orpah, and the other was named Ruth. Uh, if, you're, if you're a parent here and, or a, grand, a grandparent, and you guys are expecting and you're trying to figure out what to name your child, and she ends up being a girl, I wouldn't suggest the name Orpah. She'll end up getting the name Willie. I'm just saying. But anyway, you won't get it until later. <laughs> and as it happens later on, the two sons also die. And so now she just got it. And so now it leaves these three women, Naomi and her two daughter-in-laws, struggling through the pain of the loss of their companions. Naomi decides that she's going to return to Bethlehem. Orpah decides that she's going to return back to her hometown in Moab and be with her her family, where she came from, and she's released to do so. 
Ruth is now standing between Naomi, who represents where she's compelled to go, and Orpah, who represents where she wants to go, but she leans towards Naomi, and she says to her, where you go, I will go. Your God will be my God, and your people will be my people. It's a famous verse. But the cost of her decision isn't easy because she's now in Bethlehem as a Moabite woman. She's a minority woman considered to be an illegitimate citizen. She is looked at as a second-class citizen. She's impoverished. She's a widow. She's a foreigner in a strange land, and she's disadvantaged. And yet she's able to push through the adversity, and she's willing to go through what she's going through in order for her to stay close to Naomi. Why? Because she's impressed with Naomi, and she's impressed with Naomi's God. In fact, she's filled up with the hope that she would even have even the possibility of finding favor with this good God that she only heard Naomi speak about. Now you got the background for it. The thing I love about Ruth is that in the midst of her struggle, she knew that she was in the right place, surrounded by the right people. And how many know that is imperative if we're going to walk in the path of God's favor? So when we look at the story of Ruth, we see that her life is a metaphor for the church. What do I mean by that? Her life, her struggle, her acquisition of land is a template, as it were, of the, of, of the New Testament church. Now, have I gotten you totally confused? That's good. That's exactly what I wanted. Okay. Look at someone and say, you're going to be okay. Okay. When we look at the, the life of Ruth, we see a... She, she, her life represents... She is a foreigner who moves into Hebrew covenant. And it symbolizes the New Testament church. Because we, as the New Testament believers, became party crashers. In an all-inclusive, private members-only world event, the New Testament writer put it like this. At that time, you were without Christ having been aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise. But now, someone say, but now. In Christ, those of you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Jesus. That's the analogy. That's the metaphor that Ruth's life represents to us. Now, Ruth is now trying to survive in Bethlehem, and she's gleaning in the field. So we pick up her story here. And let me just briefly, I don't have time to get into it. Let me, let me just briefly tell you what gleaning means. That means there, there was in those days something called the law of gleaning. It was, it, I wish I had time, but I don't really have a whole lot of time to get too deeply into it. But let's just say it was, it was the nation's welfare system of that day. And so when the harvesters would go into the field to reap the fields and to harvest the fields of wheat, the law was that, that the poor people could come along behind the harvesters and any scraps that would fall to the ground that would be left behind, they called it the law of gleaning. And if you were poor, you were on welfare, uh, the nation's welfare, you would be able to go behind and you would be able to collect whatever scraps uh, were left over. So, so you understand. So now Ruth, she's gleaning in the fields. And your Bible says, now she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz. How 
how many of you just happened into God's blessings? You didn't do anything to deserve it. You didn't do anything to earn it. You can't, you can't explain your way out of it. You just know that there was a door that was open for you and you happened to show up at the right time at the right place. There was someone who, who was there to bless you. There was a divine connection that God had orchestrated in your life. Someone that was going to make a mark that cannot be erased in your life to change the trajectory of your life. And you didn't even do anything to earn it. It was all him. You just happened to be there. That's not a coincidence. That's not happen chance. That's not, that's not someone just like, oh, I just, I just accidentally. That's God, your God, your father. You are his daughter. You are his son. And he is orchestrating your life. Amen. So she, she happened to be there. Now, now Boaz, is a, he's a man of means, and he's also a person of influence. And he sees her from across the field. And you know the story he says to the people who are working in his field, he said, who's that woman over there gleaning? They said, that's Ruth, a Moabitist. She traveled from Moab with Naomi. And he says, here's what I want you to do. When she comes in this direction, when she, when she starts moving and gleaning in your direction, I want you to drop handfuls on purpose. Like you're, 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 you're harvesting, you get the wheat, you, you, you pull it apart, you, you use your hands, you do this, whatever you do, drop handfuls, extras, on purpose. So here comes Ruth. From the background to the foreground. From anonymity to notoriety from obscurity to suddenly being noticed. You know what the favor of God will do in your life? The favor of God will cause you to be noticed by the right people who have the ability to bless you, not because you manipulated them, but because they can do nothing else but honor the voice of God in their own, in their own heart. God will do that for you. But here's the key. Watch this. How many know it pays to be moving in the right direction? So what if Ruth... She would have been over there on the other end of the field and those guys are over there and they're dropping handfuls on purpose. What if Ruth had stopped short and said, you know, this is a dead-end job. I can't see this going anywhere. You know, some of these other people, they've been here a lot longer than I have anyway. So they got seniority on me. I don't know why I have to put in so much effort and the sun is hot out there. Right? How many know that it pays to be moving in the right direction? And one of the signs that you're moving in the right direction is when you can look over your shoulder. I wonder if Sandy's watching right now. When you can look over your shoulder and see where you came from. Now to other people who are watching, it didn't look like you've come far at all. Maybe to them, they're like, I don't know why she's so happy all the time. Like what's she got to be happy about? What's she always talking about how good God is to her? Doesn't look like she's successful at all. Yeah, <laughs> but you don't know where I've come from. Like, I may not be where I want to be yet, but at least I'm not where I used to be. Amen? And so all of a sudden, here's Ruth, and she's just, she's just moving in the, in the direction that she's moving. And, she, and she's, just, she's just out there doing what she does every day. And all of a sudden, she's just, well, what is this? Did you see all this wheat laying? And over here, too, there's some more. What is this right here? I'll, what, what, what is going on around here, right? It's like when you're out fishing and everybody on the other side of the lake is, was laughing at you because they saw the, the bait that you pulled out and everybody knows you can't use that bait in that lake. You don't even know what you're doing. You don't even belong in this place. You don't have any right to be here. You have no idea what you're doing. And, and all of a sudden, but, but after they see you catch the first one 
and the second one, (laughs) and the third one, somebody talked to me, and the tenth one, and the twelfth one, suddenly everybody on the other side of the lake, what are they doing? (laughs) Right? Why? Because favor is contagious. And Ruth doesn't realize that Boaz has had a conversation about her. And he and she didn't hear it. He has released blessing into her life and she didn't even hear the conversation. She's just a recipient of something that's already been spoken over her. Hello. And she didn't even hear the conversation. All she knows is that she's just moving in the direction that she's moving. Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his what? Come on, somebody, to his what? There are people in the room right now and people who are watching me right now who in in an attempt to simply follow God, you've noticed increase showing up in your life. You haven't graduated from seminary. You haven't been holding worldwide evangelistic crusades. You're just someone who loves God and is called according to his purpose. Now, you didn't hear the conversation. You don't know what heaven was saying about you. You don't know the conversation that took place in heaven. You're just a believer out doing every day what you believe you're supposed to be doing and honoring God. And all of a sudden, you notice some things starting to show up and work out that had never worked out before. Like they had never worked out before. Almost like someone had gone ahead of you, preparing it for you. Does anybody in here know what it's like to just stumble on to some blessings. Just stumble on to blessings. Like you didn't work for it. You didn't earn it. You didn't orchestrate it. You didn't manipulate anybody to get it. All you had to do was reach out by faith and take hold of it. Does anybody know what it's like to just roll up on the blessings of God? Just stumble up onto some of the blessings of God. Amen. It's the favor of God. It's the favor of God. And the people who I saw just react right now, (laughs) I can tell you are the ones who are living in the second chapter of Ruth. Have you ever watched people, they'll come into a service like this and they'll look around and they'll watch people who are, oh, they, they produce this they, they, this, they explode in this over the top, glamorous, boisterous level of praise. And they think, well now, how nice is that? Isn't that nice? They're so animated. They're so emotional. Isn't it wonderful how they could be so emotional? But it's not that we're emotional. It's just that you can't be in a burning building and find a fire escape and still remain indifferent. Like when you get down to the end of your rope and you don't know what your next move is and you don't know what's going to happen 
And all of a sudden, like out of nowhere, stuff starts dropping and falling into place for you. And you know that you didn't do anything to conjure that up. It only could have happened because you serve a good God. And God, once again, you showed up at the right place at the right time. And when the enemy thought he had you where he wanted you, all of a sudden, boom, where did that come from? Boom, where did that show up from? Boom, where's all this favor coming from? Like when you didn't know where it was coming from, God showed up at the right time. And I can't help from praising him. I know you think this is emotional, but if you knew what I knew or went through what I was going through, you'd worship too if you'd look over your shoulder and see where you came from. Because when I think about the Lord, how He saved me, how He raised me, how He filled me with the Holy Ghost, how He picked me up, spun me around, set my feet on solid ground. It makes me want to shout. Yeah. Makes me want to shout. Can't help it. I'm compelled to praise him. I know you think I'm crazy, but I, I'm motivated from the inside out to worship him. Hallelujah. If you were to grab a chapter out of Ruth's life, you'd see a Moabitist <laughs> woman in a foreign land, second class, illegitimate citizen, impoverished, disadvantaged, and widowed. But Ruth knew something, that a chapter is a chapter, is a chapter. The next chapter, she marries Boaz. Yes, she does. Do you remember what Boaz said? I want you to go in front of her. Well, I tell you, I feel like I'm preaching a little bit this morning, I tell you. I want you to go in front of her and I want you to drop handfuls on purpose. Handfuls represents your provision. Purpose represents your destiny. And the umbilical cord between provision and purpose is favor. Everything you have, your talent, your ability, your time, your availability, your resources, your dreams, your passion, your vision, your, your creativity, all of that is for you. God gave you those things for purpose. Someone say purpose. And God says, you want to find your provision? If you're diligent to your provision, I'll help you. If you're diligent to your purpose, I'll help you find your provision. Provision is found in purpose. You find your purpose, you find your provision. So Pastor Doug, what was the purpose of all that? Like there was a lot of people there. What was the purpose of him spotting her and blessing her and her gleaning? What was the purpose of her traveling from Moab and, 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 and deciding, I, I, I forsake the gods of my people and I follow Naomi's God and him only will I serve? What was the purpose in all that? Ruth and Boaz had a son. His name was Obed. Obed had a son. His name was Jesse. Jesse had a son. His name was David. King David. 
Ruth was the great grandma of King David. And she was the great, 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 great grandma of Jesus. You know what I love about Ruth and her story? I love, I love, I love that when God Almighty, the creator of the universe, decided and handpicked the lineage through which his only begotten son would come through, he says, I want a woman from the hood. Impoverished, disadvantaged, Look down on, come on, somebody who felt like she didn't belong. Everybody, st- I want that one to represent the lineage through which my son will come. Because I'm telling you guys, listen to me this morning. It doesn't matter what your background is. Listen, there is nothing in your past that can hinder your future that God has predestined for you from the foundation of the earth if you'll be at the right place that God has planned for you. There is, there's something powerful about moving in the right direction. You, you think the testimony you heard earlier in the service, you, 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 think, you think about that. Just getting to Cross Hill Church She's not showing up here because that's the easy decision. And that's the, that's the convenient way of doing church. She's putting her destiny before her convenience. And she's saying, I don't know, it's not easy, it's hard. But I know God, listen, a chapter is a chapter is a chapter is a chapter. And I know some of you look at that and you say, well, wait a minute, that's not fair. But favor isn't fair. Father, we thank you this morning. God, we just lift you up today. I ask that you just continue to pour this into the hearts of people, that we put our favor finder glasses on, that we not let the enemy hold us back, but we step into purpose this morning. We step into our purpose and our destiny, honoring you with every step that we have, knowing that it is not because of who, what we've done or what we're doing. It is because of our relationship and our identity with you. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen and amen.